New Year's resolutions. I'm calling for a New Year's resolution for Jesus Community Church. I would like all of you to participate with me. That's why we're the church. The church resolution. I would like to make 2014 the year of hospitality. Over the last few months, I've been, as I've been reading different passages and studying for different things, I've been taken by the fact that over and over and over again in the New Testament church, they're called to be and they're shown to be hospitable. And one of the things that you've heard me talk about before is that I feel like fellowship is sadly lacking in the church in America. You know, we've exchanged fellowship for coffee and red juice and maybe a donut. And we never get beyond the surface things. We never really get to know people. We never get to the inside where we can see where they've come from, why they are where they are. Uh, see some of the, the things that they deal with day in and day out. And doing just simple math. If Christy and I were to have one family over a month, the fellowship with them. We get to have 12 families over, and that would leave a lot of you guys out. So if we go two families a month, that's 24, and there's still people left out. And that's frustrating to me because there's a lot of you that I want to get to know better, and I don't have a lot of opportunity to get to know you better. But it doesn't stop here. It's got to be here. It's got to be you guys fellowshipping amongst each other. And I know there, there are a lot of you that have a gift of hospitality, that your doors are open. When you walk in the house, you just feel blessed to be there. You feel welcome. I'm asking you, though, to extend that, to, to take it outside of your comfort zone a little bit. I'm asking that each family in here would commit to inviting someone else in the church. You can even do sometimes some of the people that you're already comfortable with. Over to your house once a month. Once a month. Now think about that for a minute. Okay? If I do that, that means there's 13 families in here that have had fellowship, because I would be the 13th. But if those 12 people do it, that number grows exponentially. And all of a sudden, we start getting to know each other beyond... <coughs> Hey, you've worn that shirt three times in the last month. <laughs> so I'm asking that 2014, you make an effort. Open up your home. Invite people over. And even on occasion, invite somebody over that you don't know. Okay? Um, it, it's real easy. We fall into the habit of having people over that we're comfortable with, that we already know. And that's great. I'm not saying give that up. I don't want you to give that up. I want that to continue because we have some fantastic friendships and fantastic fellowship already in place here. I'm asking us to go a little further, to extend that a little bit further beyond. I think that's going to be more and more important, especially as the church grows. We want to be a people. I mean, we are, quite honestly, this is one of the best churches I've ever been in when a stranger comes in the door to making them feel welcome. Okay. Um, first time we came in the door, Mary Lou scared the snot out of me. <laughs> because she, yeah, she had that dead eye on me and she... <laughs> and I was welcome. <laughs> but it makes an impact. But I'm, I'm asking, let's go a step beyond that. Okay? Let's, after we've greeted them at the door, let's invite them home. Let's get to know them. Let's find out how we can be a blessing to them. Let's share with them how they can be a blessing to us. Okay? There's a New Year's resolution, 2014. Let's see how it goes. There will be a test. <laughs> Not by me. You've got to answer the guy upstairs. Okay. Guess where we are today? What? Colossians! I know you guys have been missing it. Because it's been a while. So we're going to get into Colossians. Back into Colossians. And we spent quite a bit of time um, on a few passages. 
talking about the attributes, the characteristics, the fruit that a Christ-filled life will bear. These things that you will have in your life if you come to know Christ. We're moving past that now. We're going we're gonna to talk on a, another section here. Um, so if you would read with me, we're in uh, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to pick up in uh, verse 16. Now 12 through uh, 15, we spent quite a few weeks on talking about what each of those attributes are, what they look like, why we should have them. We're moving ahead in verse 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. I love Paul's choice of words here. I, I love the way that he expresses this because he says a lot of things in a very few words. Okay? What is the word of Christ? The Bible. Does it extend beyond the Bible? It could. It could. But it always comes back and is always centered on, is always built on this. Okay? This is the guy. This is the primary source that God has given us to know Him. Okay? But He has also given us His Spirit that illuminates this to us, right? I mean, have you read the same passage over and over and over and over, and then one day you read it, it means something completely new to you, and it just like, boing, and, and you get something completely new out of it? Okay, there's two of us at that time. <laughs> okay. The Word of Christ starts here. Let it dwell in you. What does dwell mean? Live. Yeah. It's the, the place that it inhabits. See, we have a lot of these around our house. Every year or so I go through and I start giving them away because I look around and for some reason or another they multiply in my house. <laughs> At one point I had almost 30 Bibles in my house. And I had a study Bible for this, and I had a translation of that, and I had multiple translations over here, and then I had this devotion one there, and then I had that devotion one there. And, and I realized, uh, like 28 of them sat idle most of the time. <coughs> and I've got my reading Bible that I, I keep and I read out of, and then I have a, a particular study one that I go to when I want to compare translations. And so I started giving out those Bibles. And you know what? Sometimes I look back and I go, dang it, I wish I hadn't given that one away. <laughs> but it doesn't do you any good sitting on the shelf. It doesn't do, it's of no benefit in this position. Okay? God has not called us to be purchasers of His Word. Right? He wants it to be inside of us. Now, there is a miracle that takes place because God has promised us that He will take away our hearts of stone and He will give us hearts of flesh and He will write His commandments on them and we'll know them. Okay? But He has also told us to discipline ourselves to be intimate with His Word. <laughs> to be Bereans. Now, how many of you, after I preach, go home and check out what I say? I, I encourage you to. I encourage you to. And I, it's okay. Sometimes we're going to disagree. I had someone come up to me one time after service and said, well, my, my study notes say something different. I said, okay. Well, well, what do I do? I said, well, that's his opinion, and this is mine. I said, develop your own. But his is different. Yeah, I disagree with him. I think he got it wrong. But his is in a Bible. Now, below the line doesn't count. <laughs> Below the line is someone's opinion. Okay, above the line is what we want to focus on. So, be intimate with His Word. Let it dwell in you. But He doesn't just say, let it live in you. What does He say? Richly. Now that's where I really love what Paul is saying. 
Because it's not just um, the word in a drought. You know, it's not the word scrawny and scraggly. It's not the word poverty stricken. It's the word dwelling in you richly, abundantly, much need. One of the best ways to do this, there's a couple of things that I'll, I'll, I'll encourage you. One, in a, the scripture of the day, some of you get your scripture of the day in an email, some of you have a calendar, some of you have a little thing that you rip off and you have a new scripture day, that's not sufficient. Okay, that's a starting place. It's not sufficient. Okay, don't settle for that. Take it a step further. Read the Word. Get in a daily reading plan. Okay? Um, I mean, there's, there's, oh gosh, there's, I think I got a, an email the other day. 30 different reading plans for 2014. 30 of them? Evidently there's a need to have 30 or more. Pick one. Read through the Bible in a year. As a matter of fact, if you want a Bible that is set up, it's the one-year Bible, I've got some upstairs. I'll give you one. Read through the Bible in a year. Okay? But find a plan that you can get into the Word. But that's not enough. I I'm telling you right now, that's not enough. I have been on the same reading plan for four years. <laughs> and there are times where I get to a specific spot and my brain flatlines. And I go right over it. Usually right around in numbers. <laughs> sometimes still in Jeremiah. I, sometimes I have made a point. This year, or actually last month, I went through Jeremiah again for the fourth time. And I made a point, anytime I found myself flatlining, to go back and read it again. Okay? Be intimate with it. Take time. You know, we've got this mentality. Rush, 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 rush. We're so busy in our lives. Matter of fact, that's one of the things that uh, we're going to deal with, I'm hoping, probably the first part of the summer this year, is being still. Be still. Do you realize that God has not designed us to be as busy as we are? Look at the natural outcomes of them, the anxiety that comes with it, the heart disease that comes with it, all of the different health problems that come with being so busy. God doesn't want us to be like that. We need to learn to say no and cut some things out. Give His Word time. Okay? Yeah, have a scripture of the day. Perfect. <coughs> have a daily reading. Even better. Take time to get into the reading. Let it soak into you. Meditate on it. Let it become a part of you. But one more thing, and this is something that for some reason or another, I don't understand why, but as soon as you get out of a certain Sunday school class area, you're no longer required to memorize Scripture. And I think that's a shame. I think that's a shame. Now I'm remembering, um, I can't remember the gentleman's name, he was a, a colonel in the Air Force in Vietnam, and his plane was shot down. And he was taken to, he spent some time in the Hanoi Hilton, and then he was taken to another um, prisoner of war camp. What was that? John McCain? No, no, it was a, another man. Um, while he was in this about four by four cube, he was laying there, and they had, you know, the little tapping things where they could communicate back and forth. But most of their time, he spent alone, alone with his thoughts. And he said, one of the things that came to him was quoting scripture. And as a child, they had been challenged. He was a, he grew up a Baptist. Now, there's one, you say what you want about the Baptists. They know the word. They teach their kids the word. You suck it in in the Baptist church, and they know the word. And he started quoting scripture, quoting scriptures, quoting, and he couldn't believe how much scripture he had actually memorized and filed away. And God was calling back to his remembrance, times of encouragement, when he would be down and when he would be hurting and he would be alone and, and suffering abuse and, and, and malnutrition. And God would bring these words to his remembrance. Okay? Make it a habit. 
to memorize his word. Make it a habit. Pick a passage and memorize it. Let it become part of you. Let it dwell in you richly. So that in any situation, in any circumstance, God's word is there with you. You don't have to go, oh, wait a minute, when I get home I'll look it up and give you a call. Let it dwell richly in you. Now I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you a direct question. This should embarrass you. How much of the Bible did a young Jew have to know by the time he was 12? Anybody? Entire books, first five books, wasn't it? He should have had the majority of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, memorized. The first five books. Okay? And then, at 12, depending how well he did, if he was deemed worthy, he could go further in his studies, and they would memorize other parts, like the prophets. Okay? Like the Psalms, things like that. Okay? We don't require enough of ourselves. God has given us absolutely marvelous and fantastic brains. I mean, it'll work. It might be a little rusty. You might have to crank on it a little bit, squirt a little oil in there. Get it to work for you. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. Luca, I just realized you're sitting over there. I didn't dismiss the 10 to 12 year old. <laughs> you're welcome to stay, but if Who's teaching 10 to 12? Is that Dom? That's Kathy? I'm sorry. Feel free. I forgot you guys were still in here. <laughs> sorry, Cassie. Sorry, guys. I just looked at my Poor Lucas sitting over there with my like, um, Next time, wave at me. Okay. Okay. So the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let's look at what he says after that, because it gets even better. As soon as I find my place again. <clears throat> Why? Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing. Now, back in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we talked about this a little bit. Teaching and admonishing. But there, Paul, Paul is speaking specifically, I think, to the leadership of the church. Here, I don't think he is. I think he's speaking to everyone. Do you realize that you're responsible for the rest of the people here? You have an accountability to other people here to help them, to encourage them, to admonish them? Do, do you understand that? That when you see somebody that you think might be an error, to go and find out. Not, not be careful. We, we got to be careful here. This isn't a judgmental type thing. This isn't, you shouldn't be listening to that rock music because that's of the devil. Jimmy Swagger told me back in 1984, that's of the devil. Okay? That's what, not what I'm talking about. Okay? That's a non-essential. The essentials. Okay? When you see somebody that is deviating, that looks like they are putting themselves in danger, it is incumbent on you, it is required of you, to address that issue. Okay? If you're not sure, come and talk to me or one of the other leaders. Make us aware of it. Believe it or not, I don't see everything that goes on in the church. Matter of fact, a lot of times I don't even know about it. And somebody will come up and say, Hey, did you hear what happened so and so? No, I had no clue. Okay? I've only got two ears, and there's a lot more than two of you. Okay? This is how the body is supposed to work. We help each other. Okay? Teaching and admonishing. In order to teach and admonish, what do you have to do? You have to have the word of Christ dwelling in you richly. You've got to be able to tell where error lies in order to be able to admonish someone from their error. Right? Right? You have to understand what a mistake is to know when to call out a mistake. If you don't understand it, 
You're not in a place to admonish. You're not in a place to teach. We're all called to teach and admonish, so we've got to get to the place where we understand it. But he goes further, and he says this, teaching and admonishing in all wisdom. Now, we talked about this a little bit earlier. <clears throat> I'm going to back up to Colossians chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, I'm just going to read down for a few verses. It says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Now, what he's saying here is that we get his word in us that we would teach and admonish in all wisdom. Where does all wisdom come from? Well, let's go back over here. Which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Listen to me, there's a lot of fancy sounding things out there in the world. <coughs> A lot of plausible things out there in the world. There's a lot of things that the world will tell you that will make sense. But what does God think of the wisdom of the world? It's foolishness. It's silliness. It's not worth paying attention to. Do you understand that? Do you understand that in order to be wise, it has to come from God? That wisdom flows out from Christ, and that as we get His Word in us, it makes us wise? I don't like being a fool. I don't like feeling stupid. I hate it. I want to know. This is the best place to know. You'd be amazed at some of the things that are in here. Some of the math. Some of the science. Some of the logic. Some of the philosophy that is in here. Absolutely astounding. This isn't just an archaic storybook that teaches some principles of morals. This is the book penned of God to instruct us. Now, I know there's some smart people in our history. Aristotle, Einstein, Stephen Hawking. I, I understand there's some smart people. Not compared to God, who knows everything. Everything, you know? Um, you know, I brag on Mackenzie all the time. You know, she's doing calculus and physics. And you'll be driving down the road and she'll look over at the river and she'll start explaining to you why it ripples the way that it does. I just go, because it hit a rock. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, but there's a formula that explains why it goes that way and does this and does that. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, somebody did. Because they figured it out. <laughs> that much I and that I'm content being stupid on. Okay? Because she's trying to explain it to me. And she's talking about derivatives and those and these, and I don't care. <laughs> and I love my daughter anyway. <laughs> we have to have God illuminating in us his word in order to gain wisdom. We have to have wisdom in order to teach and admonish. We are called to teach and admonish. See, it's, it's built precept upon precept, building block upon building block. Okay? Okay? But he goes further. He doesn't just stop there. It's not just all wisdom. Then he says something else, and, and, and I've got to tell you, this next passage I struggle with. I don't feel like I have a good grasp on this next passage. Okay? He says, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. 
He repeats this almost word for word, exactly in Ephesians chapter 5. Singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I've got to tell you, I've looked at probably 12 or 15 different interpretations of this. And they range from psalms are the book of psalms, hymns are those books that were written after the psalms, and spiritual songs are just those that are encouraging that are written today. To, oh no, they're all just the psalms. They're different parts of the psalms that were written in the book of psalms. And, and they all have to be divinely inspired. Therefore, because those were the only songs written in scripture, those are the only ones that Paul is referring to. What about Miriam's song? And Mary's song? And the song of the redeemed in Revelation? What about those songs? I, I really, I don't know specifically what Paul is speaking about. I, went, I looked it up in the Greek. And really, you know what it says there? Psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. <laughs> spirit, songs. That didn't help. It didn't. I, so this, this part right here, I honestly, I don't have a good answer for you. Personally. Personally, I, I, I read a, a, a very plausible argument from one of the ministers of the Church of Scotland as to why it specifically means just the book of Psalms. Okay. But he refuses to sing, they would refuse to sing any of the songs we sing today. And, and as a matter of fact, he even went so far as to say, really the, the word singing there is, is chanting. <laughs> well, no, because the Greek is pretty plain on that, it's singing. Um, so this, this passage here, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, I don't understand what the difference is between the three. But I do understand a couple of things. One, you sing. And not up here, and not here. It comes from here and goes out there. Okay? You sing out loud. Singing. See, look, I, I mean, there could be a dozen of you in here right now singing, and I would never know it. That's not what Paul is talking about. Okay? But the way that this is phrased, what I understand this to say, is that what you are getting in here, the revelation that you are receiving in here, should birth in you the desire to come out here. A desire to sing before God. Oh man, you ain't heard me sing. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. Get a wheelbarrow. <laughs> you don't need a bucket. Just let it fall out. Quite honestly, God can take anything that comes out of your mouth and make it beautiful. Okay? Because somehow or another, He weaves into what's coming out of your mouth the harmony and the melody of your heart. And it comes out beautiful. So He says, singing, Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now check this out. With thanksgiving in your hearts. See, this is, this is one of those things that I always have to check myself in praise and worship. Because a, a lot of times in praise and worship, my mind starts running away with me. Okay, i got to remember to do this. i got to remember to do that. Is anything special coming up today? I do have a prayer request. i got to remember the prayer request. Um, got to make sure, oh, guess what? I'm going to forget to dismiss the 10 to 12-year-olds again. <laughs> I, I do stuff like that. And all of a sudden I realize, I have no idea what song we're on. And I have no idea how many we've sung since the last one I paid attention to. And, and my heart is not set on singing the praise and worship to God that He is worthy of. And I have to check myself a lot. But, but, see, it's not just enough to come back and, and catch and pay attention to the words. Are you meaning the words? Is your heart set on those words? When you are singing that He is worthy of your praise, when you are singing that, that you are thankful for what He's done, how great is our God, how awesome is He, how mighty is He, are you convinced of that in your heart, or are you just parroting it? You know? Quite honestly, we do that often. And it's got about as much meaning. Because our hearts are not in it. It's not being birthed here. 
Dennis and Jeannie shared with me a, a, a sheet of paper, and it talked about the differences between Greek thought and Hebrew thought. And in our Western culture, we are very into Greek thinking. We want to understand the logic of it. We want to be convinced of the intelligence and the logic of it. Okay, that's Greek thinking. That's Western thinking. Okay, we need to understand a lot of this was not written with that in mind. Okay, when we are singing songs, we can look at it and go, "Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I believe that too." But but we've left out the heart feeling, the heart oomph behind it. You know, the being utterly convinced that it is so. Do I really believe that he's great? That he is awesome? That he is worthy of everything that I have to give? Because I'm not giving him everything, oftentimes. With thankfulness <coughs> in your hearts. You know, I've said this before, but people, we have got to understand that we have to be a people of thanksgiving. Okay? We have to be. Because we understand what the price was paid for us. We understand the God that we serve. We, of all people in this world, have illumination to understanding this. And we have the unmitigated gall to gripe, to complain. To be discontent. But I wanted the blue card. <coughs> With thanksgiving in our heart, it's got to start here. We have to understand what it is that we have. Once we get that, we can start being thankful for it. Whatever you do, this is one of those things, remember we talked about exclusive and inclusive? Whatever. What does that include? Everything. What does it exclude? Nothing. So whatever we do, it goes even further. It says in word or deed. Now I'll go you even one better. The word here isn't talking necessarily. Okay. The word there can be what's in here. What you're thinking. The deed isn't necessarily something that is physically acted out. It can also be something that takes place here. In your heart. In word or in deed. So basically, nothing that you do is excluded. Everything that you do is, is contained in the next sentence here. Okay? Whatever you do, in word or deed, Dude? dude? Okay, dude. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything. Okay, so here we go. Here's another one of those words. Do everything. What's included? Everything. What's excluded? Nothing. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, this right here should give you pause. This right here should make you sit up and pay attention. Because he's asking us this for a reason. He's requiring of this for a reason. Why? Why? Jesus you betcha. Because he has chosen us to represent him here. You bear the mark of Christ upon you wherever you go. And he wants you to bear it well. That if they hate you, it's because of him, not because you're a moron. Not because you're a jerk. He wants them to hate you because of him. He calls us his body. 
We're his ambassadors. We're his representatives. We are the people of God. We are the children of God. Now, my children never did this. I'm just using them as an example. But they never did this. But should you have a child that embarrasses you and does something that you are completely opposed to, how do you respond as a parent? Apparently there was three words. Get the stick. Get the stick. Okay. Our punishment in the family was a swap with the stick. Okay. There's discipline. There's correction. That's part of the admonish thing here that we're talking about. Admonishment. Okay. We are to represent Christ in everything we do. You understand that? You understand that? Now, I'm, I'm going to make this pretty plain to you. You are to represent Christ in your dealings with your spouse, your children, your parents, your friends, your colleagues, strangers. You are to represent Christ by your cooking breakfast. You are to represent Christ when you clean the toilet. You are to represent Christ when you're driving down the road and that big old nasty combine pulls out in front of you doing 25. <laughs> there is no area in your life where you are excused from representing Christ. Not one. So when that combine pulls out in front of you, the words that come out of your mouth, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. And that doesn't mean you go, Jesus, get out of the way. <laughs> See, that falls over into the whole blaspheming thing, using the Lord's name in vain. Okay. Whatever you do, in word or deed, does God expect us to control our thoughts? You betcha. God expects his people to learn to control their thoughts. If we can start controlling our thoughts, we can start controlling the things that come out of our mouth. Okay? If God's Spirit is truly living in us, if He has given us a new heart, His Spirit is making its abode there, then the words that come out of our mouth should be reflective of that change in our life, shouldn't they? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? So when ugliness comes out, guess what you got inside? And sometimes it shocks me. It absolutely shocks me when I say something and I hear what I say and I realize that that's still there. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now here's one more thing, and this is funny. We come right back to where we were just a minute ago. Giving thanks to God the Father. I'm going to run through just real quick. Okay, we're in chapter 3. <laughs> Don't turn here. I'm just going to read these. Colossians 1.3. We always thank God. Colossians 1.12. Giving thanks to the Father. Colossians 2.7. Uh, just as we're taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Colossians 3.15. To which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Colossians 3.16. Uh, with thanksgiving in your hearts. Colossians 3.17. Giving thanks to God the Father. Kind of catching a little flow here. Kind of a little emphasis that Paul is putting. It doesn't matter what Paul's addressing here. It always comes back to give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. When in doubt, give thanks. If you're not sure, give thanks. When you are having a bad day, give thanks. To the one who has given you life. When things are going good, give thanks. When things are going bad, give thanks. When you're not sure how they're going, 
give thanks. Be a people of thanksgiving. Honoring to him who has done everything for you. Amen? Mm -hmm.